for as far back as I can remember, all I've ever wanted to do was make music. Not necessarily play it, but to write it. To create something from nothing. All the musicians that I worship, like Brian Wilson, Elton John, Lennon and McCartney, were songwriters first and foremost. They created emotional art, and when you listened to it, it did something to you. Notes and words in the right order can give you goosebumps, can make you cry. Nothing else does that, and I was in complete awe of it. Great songwriters are able to thin the veil between our world and some higher plane of existence, and I felt called to be one of those guys. It sounds silly, but I was absolutely certain that God, whatever you know that may be, was calling me to do that. My head was filled with these pie-in-the-sky cliches to chase your dreams and trust your gut. If you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. <laughs> and uh, and I, I believed it. <laughs> I became certain that this obsession with music that I had was a sign that music was what I was put here on earth to do. So I begged my parents to buy me a guitar, and I hacked my way through garage bands with all the power chords and cheap gear and bad songs you expect. But as time passed, I got better, and so did the bands that I played with. As the years passed, we began to play out and fill rooms, and I started to see the potential for success. It was exhilarating in the beginning. Each gig I played was better than the one before it, and I felt like if I worked hard enough, this crazy dream I had might actually be possible. But as my music career was on the rise, another part of my life was suffering. I have two brothers, and my youngest brother Josh was diagnosed with autism, with severe autism in 1990. We always had a great relationship growing up. I protected him, bonded with him, loved him, and felt for him. But something changed after college. He began to treat me differently. He became angry and at times even violent toward me. And it was just me. It wasn't my other brother Brad, not my parents, just me. Whether or not it was actually true, I got in my head that this resentment began when I started pursuing music. I felt like he hated me because I was chasing my dream while he couldn't. While he was nonverbal and in some ways trapped inside his own body. And it broke my heart because he had to hear about my dream all the time. Everybody knew me as the musician, as the creative, as the guy that was doing the thing out of the ordinary. So people would talk to me about it, they talked to him about it, and I became extremely self conscious about it. But I can't imagine how he must have felt because we were brothers. <coughs> And I could tell that he was just like me, an artist. I'll get through this, I promise. <laughs> he had ambition and creativity burning inside him, just like me, but with far fewer outlets through which to express it. Meanwhile, I had the luxury of having both the dream and the ability to chase it. I hated myself for it. So I felt that I deserved what happened next, in what I call the, the struggle period. Right. <clears throat> From the outside looking in, professional musician must have looked like a great gig. I got to play rock music in a bar every night. I got to play with bands that were on the radio. I got to record in a studio. They didn't see all the nights over the next eight years that I went to bed hungry. The times I slept in the van, played for nothing, was ripped off and humiliated by club owners. The times my credit card was declined in front of my friends, or my electricity was shut off. That was a fun one. But I was going for it, and that must have seemed better than working in a cubicle to some people, but it wasn't. And sometimes I wished my brother Josh could be there to see how pathetic this dream of mine actually was at times. I kept grinding away in the bars for years, and the gigs didn't get much better, but I did. People of influence started to take notice. 
My band hired a manager and an agent. We showcased for executives, and we even began discussing a recording contract with a major label. And as most people probably know, getting signed is the ultimate goal of every indie band ever. And for us, for a brief period of time, it seemed like a deal was actually imminent. But as you can guess by the title of this event, <laughs> you know, it wasn't. So a year passed between since when that recording buzz, contract buzz began and this point in the story, and I was losing my passion for music. Hundreds of bad gigs and hostile and disinterested audiences, the opposite of you guys, uh, had left me bitter and jealous. So many people that I knew were having success in their lives, and I had been basically at the same level for years. I was endlessly comparing my career to everyone else's. So I started to give my friends and family hints that something big was coming for us. It was a dumb thing to do, but I wanted them to be proud of me so badly. I wanted the last eight years to mean something. So finally, the big day came, this big conference call to wrap up all the details for a record deal. And I'd been holding my breath for months for this call. I remember thinking, it's my biggest memory of that call, that when my agent, when I picked up the phone, his voice sounded weird. And I was confused because this was supposed to be a jubilant occasion, what he'd been working for for years. And then he flatly told me that our deal had fallen through. And that's the last thing I remember hearing. Everything went numb, tunnel vision. And looking back now, there was no way we were going to get that deal. That was folly. Because my music just wasn't good enough. And that's a hard thing to admit. It never occurred to me at the time because... Musicians have to be their biggest cheerleaders. They're only cheerleaders. But if I had been good enough, it, none of it would have been the struggle that it was. And I can see that now. Weeks before that call, I had obviously prematurely written a press release about our signing. <laughs> Jinxed it, didn't I? Um, <laughs> I read this release about our finally having made it, about how local boys make good and all that kind of stuff. And the day after the call, I erased it from my computer because I couldn't bear to read it, much less know it was on there in the first place. I was so afraid I might accidentally open it or see the file on the desktop and be crushed all over again. Just knowing that this bit of foolishness existed was, was too much. So a few months passed, and my band of five years of playing together broke up. Though I could barely stand to get out of bed or face anyone, I resolved to try again, this time on my own. No band, just me. There was really no other option. I was nearly 30 years old, and no one wanted to be Peter Pan with me anymore. I wrote some music that I was proud of and began the process all over again. New websites, new promo photos, New business cards, always with the business cards. You make 500 of these things. Yeah. <laughs> One thing changes, they're no good. <laughs> but you always, you're always getting them, you're always ordering them. So this was the fourth time I started over like this. But this time, and though I couldn't see it right away, it was over before it began. I remember the exact moment that I knew it was finished, that, that I was finished. It was nearly a year after that fateful call, and I was playing a gig on Mackinac Island, and it had all the makings of a great gig. The setting was gorgeous, the audience was responsive, the pay was pretty decent, and halfway through my second set, I started to feel hot, like really hot, like I'm sweating through my shirt and my sweater hot, and my fingers stop working. I'm trying to form chords in the guitar and nothing's happening, and there's some sort of disconnect. My mouth went dry. You know, I didn't have the language for what I was experiencing at that time, but I later realized that I just had my first panic attack in front of about 100 people. It was the first of many signs of my rapidly declining mental health. So I muddled through a few more songs and did my best, but I had to end the show abruptly. I went back to my room and sobbed. As time passed, I realized that that was my body trying to send me a message. I was suffering even though I trained my brain to just keep going, keep going, no matter what, keep plowing forward. I'd had enough. 
it was time to admit that I didn't want this anymore. Despite the fact that I was only 30 and fortunate enough to be married to my best friend and the love of my life, Shannon. Yeah. Sure, she, she's here. I was convinced that my life as I knew it was over, that I would never get to do anything meaningful again. And worst of all, angry that my heart and my gut had misled me. Because that's a terrible feeling to find out that your compass, the only thing you know for sure, was dead wrong. But there was one bright spot. I hoped desperately that my brother would stop resenting me now. That my failure might somehow be cathartic for him. That some good could come from it. Not that he wanted me to fail or anything like that, but it's proof of how often we romanticize dreams and forget how they can become nightmares. That even people with everything going for them can blow it. Shannon told me that she'd always been afraid of what would happen to me if music didn't work out for me, of how I would take it if that day ever came, because I put my whole sense of being into it. But she also said that I had been given a gift by being able to hate music. It makes it easier to walk away from something when you can't stand it. You don't wonder if you made the wrong choice. And I didn't wonder. I hated music for what it had done to me. This thing that had steered my entire life became unbearable. I stopped listening to it altogether. I changed the channel when songs came on. I drove around in silence. I had no idea what I was going to do next, but I felt two things very strongly. One, I didn't think I had the will to start something of my own again. And two, I had no interest in setting foot in a bar where so much of the pain in my life had occurred over the past decade ever again. <laughs> 